Right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you from San Diego as per usual. And today I'm joined by Michelle Tillis Letterman, who is in New Jersey. How are you doing, Michelle? I'm doing well. Happy New Year. Yeah, you too. Happy New Year. And Michelle is one of Forbes top 20, top 25 networking experts and the author of four books, including internationally known the 11, law, the 11 laws of likability and her latest, The Connectors Advantage, which is what we're going to talk about today. Um, so quickly getting, getting started here, Michelle, um, what was the genesis behind The Connectors Advantage of writing that book in the first place? It was actually a follow-up to my first book, The 11 Laws of Likeability. And it was funny, my, my brother-in-law walked into my office as I was finishing up The Connector's Advantage and he goes, oh, writing another networking book. And I said, no, 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 this one's about being a connector. He's like, well, what's the difference between networking and a connector? And I said, networking is something that you do, but a connector, that's who you are. And mm. so the, the impetus was moving from this idea of this thing called networking, which I actually hate that word so much because it has the word work in it. Right. So who wants to do that <laughs> um, to the idea of, you know, when you're a connector, you're just prioritizing relationships in everything that you do in every interaction. So it's not flipping a switch. It's just embodying these mindsets that I teach. Right. And and you say that uh, likability enables connection. Uh, so how do I mean, how can people develop likability? I mean, some people will are, are naturally likable and other people um, maybe don't feel like they have the same level of likability for one reason or another. So how do you actually, how do you, <laughs> how do you help people improve their likability, if you like? Yeah, like I raised my that was hand. A lot of, because... That was a lot of likes there, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm one of those people that didn't feel that I was so naturally likable. And that's actually how my research started because I had a very polarizing response from people and people loved me or they hated me, but there wasn't a mm -hmm. lot of in between. So I wanted to understand what I was doing. And what I learned was um, you can't make anybody like you, but we are all innately likable. And what we need to do is enable people to see what is likable about us. So it is about understanding what drives likability. And that was the first book. And that's kind of how we think about what to do before, during and after a conversation. Um, but it's okay. And, and one of the things I had to learn was to accept that not everybody's going to like me. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and, and I agree. And I think, um, and I think, I think a lot of likability, though, comes from authenticity, though, really, at the end of the day. I mean, if you're an authentic, I mean, if you're a terrible person, then obviously, that's different if you're authentically terrible. But I mean, if you're an if you're authentic, and real, I think that's where likability comes from. Well, that's actually the first law of likability is the law of authenticity. And that's kind of the thread and the foundation for all the other laws. And the first mm -hmm. mindset of a connector is about being open and accepting. And so that, you know, builds off of the idea of authenticity, because when we're open and accepting, it's not just about open and accepting of the other person, but it's open and accepting of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what, what are what I call unique charms are what we bring to the table um, and understanding. And so you can kind of see how it builds off each other, because, for example, one of my unique charms is that I'm very talkative, which is working well for podcasts, but doesn't sure. always work well in other situations. And a unique charm is something that is kind of innately who we are and a part of our personality, but it's not a, a quality that always works for us. Right. So it's understanding how to flex that. Right. And I guess, I mean, part of it is, yeah, I mean, how to flex it. To, and the first part is being aware, as you said, is, um, you know, be open and accepting, understanding who you are yourself and then understanding like um, that you have, that all of us have, um, you know, unique traits or whatever that may serve us in some instances and in other instances we may need to dial back. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> And when we talk about flexing, I want to be clear, I'm not saying anybody needs to change who they are because we're all mm -hmm. fantastic, but it's an idea of um, momentarily adjusting your style to enable that person to connect with you, to enable that likable nature about yourself so that it's not being overpowered. I have literally had people walk, you know, <laughs> and step back from me because, I, and I'm like, oh, coming on too strong, need to tone that down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And then you say um, connectors need to have a, a clear vision. What do you mean by that? So first, let me define the connector's advantage because 
Mm -hmm. That's the title of the book. The connector's advantage is the idea that whatever it is you're working on, you're going to get there faster, easier, and better with relationships through your connections. So whether it is a new job, a promotion, a new client, a new referral, even health and happiness, I have the statistics in the book to show that connections enable all of those goals and objectives. So to have a clear vision, right, is to know what you're working on. You can't get the results faster, easier, and better if you don't know what results Mm -hmm. you're looking for. And so having a clear vision is knowing what you want and being willing to ask for it. Mm. That's interesting. And I do think that sometimes, um, uh, a lot of times, I would say people don't have a clear vision of what they're looking for, where they want to get to. And I think that is probably a a great time, given what we've all been through. It's a great time to to take a step back and reflect and really ask yourself, what is it that you really want? And, uh, And then are you prepared to put in the work to get there? But I do think a lot of people go around in a somewhat of a fog without having a clear vision of where they want to get to. Yes. And here's the thing. For me, a clear vision doesn't have to be five, 10 years down the road because Mm -hmm. that's tough. I always hated that college essay question. What do you want to do in five, 10 years? I'm like, I don't know. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Um, But when I talk about clear vision, it's, it kind of goes hand in hand with the uh, mindset of the spirit of generosity. Because one of the things I teach in the spirit of generosity is to always ask the other person the question, what are you working on? Or who do you want to connect with? Or how can I help you? And so it's that idea of how do I add value and how do I give to this other person? But I also teach that you need to be prepared to answer that question. And that's the, the clear vision, right? So if somebody then says, well, what are you working on or how can I help you? It doesn't have to be my huge hag, right? <laughs> the big, mm-hmm. hairy, audacious goal for five to 10 years out. It could just be what I'm working on right now. So when the Connectors Vantage first came out, um, my response to that question was, I'm working on getting 100 reviews on Amazon. Right. It can be mm-hmm. a very clear, small idea. It could, one time I was doing a speech and I was talking about this and, and um, I put out there that I wanted to connect with Michelle Obama. Right. So it can be big. It can be Mm -hmm. small. And by the way, I did get and spoke to (laughs) Michelle Obama's chief of staff while she was in office or while she was sort of in the White House, whatever. She wasn't actually in office, but Mm -hmm. um, (laughs) her husband was. So um, you never know when you voice those objectives, those goals, um, how people might respond. And so that clear vision, whether it's small or big, needs to be shared. Yeah, no, it needs to be shared because I mean, there's some there's something about accountability when you put it out there because you know people are going to ask you about it. Uh, therefore, <laughs> you know you feel a little bit more compelled to actually achieve it. Um, you also say uh, mention abundance, and I think this is a really key point as well because to some degree we live in a we live in a, a, a strange culture today, or there's a pervasive culture of of like um, comparison culture and jealousy and all this kind of stuff. But the re- the reality is that if you have an abundant mindset, there's something there for everybody, right? And you and and when and if you're going after it, when you're not taking it from someone else, you're taking it from an ever expanding pie. Well, I actually think you hit on one of the things that I teach because an abundant mindset is hard to adopt, and it's probably mm-hmm. the hardest of the mindsets for me personally because scarcity is real and tangible. And I personally grew up with financial scarcity. Mm -hmm. Um, And we tend to make decisions based on an anecdote to something that's missing, right? So that's why I went into finance the first decade of my career. (laughs) Um, It was, I wanted that financial security. And so um, when scarcity drives us, we tend to be protective. We tend to be defensive. We tend to be jealous. um, And, you know, we, we look at everybody as competition. So an abundant mindset is that, that switch from not everything's great, but for the possibility that things can be better than they are. And when you said that we're in that comparison, one of the things that I say is don't compare yourself against other people. Track yourself against your individual goals because there's always somebody who's doing better and there's always somebody who's doing worse, Mm -hmm. right? But if you are happy with your progress, then you can feel that sense of abundance. Yeah, no, I, I always use the, um, I'm, I'm big into martial arts and I, I always use that as an example of whereby martial arts, just like you said, there will always be somebody bigger, stronger, faster, younger. <laughs> um, and that uh, when you when you do martial arts and the real spirit of martial arts is you're not looking at the person on your left or right, you should be looking at yourself and your continuous improvement and in, in basically the same thing as what you're saying right now. It's, it's, it's you you should focus on. Absolutely. And there's one other thing that I 
I personally practice that I thought has been very helpful in adopting an abundant mindset. And that's the practice of gratitude. Um, mm -hmm. And again, there's lots of work out there on gratitude and, and the, the physical and, and mental benefits of it. Um, for me, it doesn't have to be like journaling every day and, and so structured or strict. My work is about making this easily implementable in small little ways within your life and building muscle memory around them. And so for me, it's a question every day. It's what was the best part of your day? Or what mm -hmm. is one thing you did today to make somebody else smile? Or right. Right. Like just it, it can be just small. Yeah. And I think that's such a great message, particularly uh, in the in this in the times that we're in. That's a great yeah. message. The other one, uh, the one that just the last one I want to just uh, pick out and focus on is the is trust. Right. And we all know that um, trust is hard to build, easy to lose. Yeah. Um, but um, from your point of view, how can, what are what are the building blocks to trust? I actually talk about the four pillars of trust and they are authenticity, which we've talked about a little bit, mm -hmm. vulnerability, which is one of those words that people don't like. And I'm one of them um, until I learned that vulnerability is really not about weakness. It's about openness and that vulnerability can actually lead to credibility. Um, and so if we can view vulnerability in that way of being open and being sharing of ourselves, what you're doing with when you are vulnerable is you're giving trust to somebody else and you have to mm -hmm. give trust to get trust. The third pillar is transparency. And again, that's not about giving everything away, but it's about keeping people in the loop. And that's actually one of the top things that leads to employee job satisfaction is understanding how my work impacts the bigger picture and having recognition and appreciation for that work. So um, when we think about transparency, it's the uh, why behind the what, right? Here's the decision tell me why, mm. right? Or here is what I can tell you, um, but he, you know, here's what I will do, right? And the last yeah. pillar is consistency. Mm -hmm. And I and I think that's incredibly important. But I just like to go back again, as you mentioned, the kind of vulnerability and and that I think I think sometimes we've done a disservice by you know, we call things like this soft skills. So we kind of <laughs> downplay them a little bit, or as you say, like vulnerability sounds well to some people, me included, sounds a little squeak, you know, it sounds a little squishy. Um, but the way you have explained it here about openness and transparency, I think that's a that's such a much better way of putting it because I think yeah, I think people want to want to understand what's going on and they want you to be communicate openly with them. And I think if um, and I think that may go such a long way, as you said, particularly in employee satisfaction is when when they, especially with their leaders, when their leaders are open and transparent, then they feel okay. Uh, you know, I can trust this place and I can trust these people. It creates psychological safety within the workplace, because if you think about vulnerability, I'm not talking about like revealing your weakness to every single person. You want to be selective with it mm -hmm. um, and, and, and make choices. But here's a choice you can make when you are a leader and you have somebody who's made a mistake. You have a choice of how you handle that mistake. And it, when you are vulnerable and you share about a mistake you might have made or talk about how you overcame something and that they will too, that is vulnerability. Right, and that is also transparency. And what you've just created is the ability for somebody to feel safe taking a risk because you know, without risk, there is no reward. And, and mm -hmm. so you create that, that safety for that person in the organization. So um, I always say soft skills are really, really hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they are. And that's why I, I think we've done a disservice or whoever named them soft skills in the first place did it did, did it a severe disservice because it, they tend to get pushed to the side. Um, and the other thing that you mentioned there is consistency. And I think that's that's another thing that's incredibly important because there's nothing that that turns people off more than somebody who's extremely unpredictable. Um, but Absolutely. if if somebody is pretty consistent and you know how they operate, you know how they're going to react and all of that kind of thing, then, you know, that that's, that's a much more comfortable environment, even for difficult conversations. Well, trust is fluid. And all of the micro actions that we have on a daily basis are either going to contribute to building trust or to breaking it. So, you know, if you kind of think about the meter going up and down, that inconsistency will continuously drop that meter um, and start to erode trust. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. And I did, I did say that was the last one we were going to cover, but I changed my mind. I just wanted to talk <laughs> about, I just wanted to talk about the generous spirit one quickly, because I think, again, in the times that we live in, I think a, a, a generous spirit is, is a very good message. It is um, the crux of being a connector is that generous spirit. I think without that, uh, if you cannot adopt that mindset, you will never truly be a connector. Um, and that builds off of the uh, law of likability called the law of giving. And it's mm -hmm. the idea of give because you can and because you want to without expectation of something in return. And to understand that when you give in that way, um, you actually elevate all and you give yourself permission to receive. And that's really hard sometimes for connectors because we're really good at giving and then it's hard to ask and you know, it's hard to receive because it, again, it makes you feel like you couldn't do it. Um, but that's mm -hmm. not true. What you are doing when you receive is you are enabling somebody else to feel the value you feel when you are able to help. Yeah, and I think that's a very, I think that's a really powerful point. I just want to double underline that is that you're giving somebody else the opportunity to feel what you're, what you like to feel. Exactly to feel valued, to feel appreciated, to feel that they were able to give back because nobody ever, nobody wants to kind of feel indebted, um, mm -hmm. you know, and the relationship will strengthen when there is a reciprocity, even if it's not direct reciprocity, right? So a lot, yeah. I've had people give to me and that I wasn't able to return, um, but I will then let them know that because of them, I did this. Yeah. And that they inspired others to, you know, have this result. Yeah, no, I think that's I think that's incredibly important. And I think that's a great takeaway for people here to to bear in mind is that it's not just about you, it's about also providing other people with the opportunity to to experience what you're experiencing and facilitate that. So the book is called The Connector's Advantage, Seven Mindsets to Grow Your Influence and Impact. All of Michelle's information will be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Um, well, a little bit about me is that I am an animal loving travel and adrenaline junkie, mother of two boys and two adopted dogs. Um, <laughs> uh, because I share that information because that's what people connect about and connect on. We don't connect on what we do. Um, but what I do for work is um, I am an author, coach, speaker, trainer, and connection creator. So I work with individuals and organizations to help people work better together and create cultures of connection and create connected leaders. So um, the best way to connect with me, the website should be right below, but it's just my full name, michelletillisletterman.com. And from there, you get to my LinkedIn and my YouTube and my blog and all the other good stuff. And I have lots of freebies that I give away if you join the community. And I hope you tell me where you heard me. Absolutely. Listen, fantastic. Uh, thanks a lot, Michelle. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. Hey, make this make 2021 your, your year to become a connector and check out Michelle's book. All right. Thank you very much. And I will see you all uh, for another interview very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.